Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. It was actually at the first time that anybody had tried calling me a hero, and I immediately shut him down. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, but I shut him down. But that was also the first time that I realized that God got involved. And there was that coming of full circle with my faith and how powerful a moment that was for me. Um, so I was more than happy to give everything up to the Lord and say, nope, I'm just thankful that he chose me, even though I didn't understand why at that time. Um, he chose me to be his instrument that morning because a very good man got to go back home to his family. The bad guy was stopped, and that's a good day for everybody. And what people don't realize and what we want to get to, because when I interview people, I want to get to know them from behind the event, post event. It wasn't You weren't just a guy with a concealed weapons permit who did a lot of training. A person who had a life, a normal life, right. with some bumps along the way. Right. Like most people. Exactly. Childhood, not perfect. Right. Uh, grandparents who loved you, took great care of you. Uh, you got in some trouble along the way at some point. Mm -hmm. I think we've all gotten in trouble. Uh, not all of us have gotten in trouble to the point where we come to the attention of law enforcement, but I'm not. I'm human. I've done some things that if I had gotten caught, I'd be in trouble. So you got in trouble. I did. Had to go to court. Prosecutor knew that use was probably something you weren't going to do again, that you weren't a risk. Um, made a pretty good deal for you. He did. And, you know, looking back now, I think that, that all things happen for a reason. People and that's why we're talking about the steps reasons. behind, because yeah. these, someone once told you that they thought this was a coincidence. Folks, this is not a coincidence. These are steps that were ordered right. so that he could be at that place at 4.30 right. in the morning so that that good man could go home to his family. Yeah. And... People look and say, how did that ever, how did he get there? I have made a mistake. This is his story. His witness is to tell you that you can have errors. Absolutely. You can ask for redemption, which for me is, and I'm going to cut ahead because this is important to me. The redemption part. In Arizona at the time, if you were convicted of a felony, even if it was going to be adjudicated to a misdemeanor, after the fact, if you did all the community service and probation, which you did, you had to appeal to the court to have your rights restored, meaning your voting rights and your ability to own, carry, possess a firearm. He's been a gun guy his whole life. So guess what? It's a humbling experience as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. You have to write the judge who convicted you, correct? Right. So I had to write a letter to the court. It's a closed, closed court hearing. Um, I also had included a letter for myself, a personal letter, and I had asked a couple people um, who knew me for a length of time to write a letter as well. Um, I wanted the judge to see that, hey, yes, you know, I'm, I'm human to error. I, I, I paid my penance. Um, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a working man. I, you know, people understand and we do make mistakes. Um, it was about a six week process before I got the letter back saying that everything was okay. I was, my rights had been restored. The judgment had actually been vacated. Um, and so after that, when I say things go back to normal, that's all relative, but Post that, I was able to get uh, non-escorted clearance for Sky Harbor Airport, clearance to work in TSA, clearance to work in the customs area, clearance to work at the FBI building. Um, so it wasn't that for a brief period of time, yes, doors were shut, but you you own it, you do what you have to do, and then you move on. And like I at the DPS conference when I came forward, when I finally came forward, um, one of the first things I said because I wanted to get out ahead of it. There's nobody in this room that hasn't made a mistake. Everybody has. And a I remember that. And I, I, I cheer you all the time, but I cheer because that's what, that's a powerful message for people to get. Yeah. Um, and so they have to understand that. But of course, the day before, you know, everybody from DPS were talking and, and we're discussing how it's going to go. I straight up told them these mother effers aren't ready for me. <laughs> They're expecting six, two blonde hair, blue eyed Johnny football quarterback, college quarterback who looks like the all American hero. Right. I'm going to roll out there. And that people is, are going to shit yeah. themselves is literally what I said. <laughs> and believe um, it or not, that is true. That video is still available on YouTube. You can, um, you can, you can see that. But yeah. It, so, so the, the whole thing itself was very humbling. And for me, sure, that, that path that you walk and the choices that you make and, and all of it actually coming together full circle for me. Um, because if I looked at it, we're, you know, 
January 12th, 2017, just two years prior to that, it was March of 2015. I woke up one morning and decided I wasn't going to be a plumber anymore. I was going to retire and I went back to school and I discovered photography. And had I not done that that morning, I wouldn't have been there that morning. That's right. So you think of all these decisions that you made that drove you to that point. Um, I tell people all the time, the person I credit to most for coming back to my faith is my friend Chris Harrell. He's the best friend in the world. Um, we just spoke yesterday, actually, and two days after I meet him, I don't know this guy from Adam. He's like, oh, by the way, my wife and I were wanting to know if you want to go to church with us. <laughs> and I literally told him, I'll take a hard pass on that, yeah. but we can hang out. But he was relentless. And I appreciate that, though, because he also had that similar story of, hey, I stumbled and fell, but I came back, and here's my redemption, and he was so passionate about it. And so if it wasn't for meeting him, I wouldn't have been able to really come down that road and find somebody who I trusted to bring me back to my place of faith, where I didn't feel guilty. Because for a long time, I didn't even feel I was welcome in the house of the Lord, which was a big problem. Anybody who goes to church and feels that angst, I, I completely appreciate that. And we also see that, you know, the, 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 the church is your soul, but in the shooting community, there's some people who don't feel welcome, don't feel accepted because they don't look the part. Right. And we've got record gun sales these days. Everyone, if you are... Legally allowed to possess a firearm and you bought one, you should be welcome in the community. If somebody doesn't welcome you, shame on them because it takes, right. does take all types, colors, creeds to be involved. And, Absolutely. And I'm all for expansion of everybody getting involved. But get training. Oh, absolutely. Well, what right. do we, we say? We say that all the time. Training, then practice. Learn right. those bad habits. Have your friends point them out to right. you. Train some more. Practice some right. more. Um, so... So yeah, so it was, it was, there was just, there's such a large dynamic and so many working parts in that and everything. So at some point, um, you know, they, they shuffle me back across the street and now I'm in a fire engine. And again, you have those realizations. Um, you know, at one point I'm, I'm going, why are my hands sticky? And I look down and I realize I'm, I'm covered in blood, you know, and I can't wash my hands cause they still have to swab them. So now I'm stuck with blood on my hands and now I'm trying not to think about the blood on my hands and you know uh, detective lamb finally comes up to me with dps he's since retired but to, to, you know i can't say enough good things about him he treated me very well very respectful um he was very aware of what i had just gone through um so it's not like he had kid gloves on but he certainly by he, he could have been he had a different demeanor towards me than what he did um you know, asked me if I felt comfortable ans answering questions. He was very honest and said, you don't have to, but we would like to get your statement. In my mind, it was a good shoot. I saved somebody's life. We went back to Buckeye PD. I gave him my statement. Everybody gave their statement. They eventually take us back to the truck. They have to walk us past the body. It's still covered with a yellow tarp. I have grown men coming up to me, crying and hugging me and thanking me. And so now I, I, I close back up again. And... I can tell, so when I do my presentation on this, you know, I include photos from the scene and everything like that. And I let everybody know it's nowhere near Hollywood. So the final shot that I had came up underneath the suspect's throat and quite frankly and bluntly exploded his skull and blood's just hemorrhaging from the entrance wound. And I'm looking at this and for a quick second and then it's like, okay, and, and I'm now I'm tending to Ed. Well, when I get back in the truck and I start driving, that's what I'm seeing replay over right. and over my head. And, and I literally go, are you kidding me? As I grip the steering wheel. Um, now, were they keeping you posted on Ed's condition through so, all the, throughout all this or were they not able to talk about that with you? Well, so they did. So they told me that he was going to be fine before I went on my way. And, um, uh, Colonel Milstead, who's since moved on from DPS, but he had phoned me and he said, hey, I just want to give you an update. It's going to be fine. Um, as soon as you get back to town, make sure you reach out to me so we can talk. And, you know, DPS was very good. They took very good care of me. Uh, Annie so Smith. You did, you did go on to Anaheim. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because in my mind, the further away I was, right. the safer I was. Um, How did I, Heidi do? Um, it was a little rough for her. <clears throat> At one point, while we were in Anaheim, I broke down as I felt I had this overwhelming sense of guilt because she didn't have a choice to be there. And that's what I told her. Now, for me, it was instinctual to stop and assist. That's just who I am. There's no way I would have ever been able to drive past that. Um, but not everybody's like that. And so I felt very guilty because I didn't give her a choice to be injected into that situation. Um 
and these are the things that we live with. These are the things that we have to heal from and get over with. Um, now, uh, like I said, you know, I came back, um, and there's things that people should know if you're going to carry and have that responsibility. You will have good days and everything's fine. You will have bad days. On the way back, the first time I passed a DPS with someone pulled over, the flop sweats, white knuckled on the steering wheel. First time I went back to the shooting range to smell the gunpowder. Um, there was different triggers. Um, and it was some dark days for a while. And then a good friend of mine by the name of James Bird, who's still with Phoenix PD, said, it's never going to be the same. And once you realize it and accept it, then you can move forward and start to heal. But he was worried about me. A lot of my friends were worried about now, me. Had, had DPS offered you any crisis management? They did. Crisis? So uh, now here's the thing, and I love DPS, and this is not a slant against them. The individual that they hooked me up with for their crisis management was more of a family therapist, and I don't feel had proper expertise in PTSD and crisis management, okay? And if you're going to do something like that, that better be your life's work or else you will do more harm than good. Um, I saw that individual four times, and on the fourth time, I said, you know what? I'm doing good. I'll call you if I need you because it was really messing me up even more. Um, I did some research. Um, I found the lady who I still see today, to this day, I should say, um, out in Scottsdale. And I have actually had, so I've done broadcasts before, let everybody know, PTSD is normal. This is what happens. You're not alone. You're not an oddball. If you can't talk to anybody, talk to me. And I've literally had people reach out. I'll be traveling across the country. Call or message me. Hey, I just saw your broadcast. Someone forwarded it to me. I need help. And I'll talk to them. And I refer them to my gal out in Scottsdale. Good. And all everybody I've referred to, they're still seeing her today. And I just had someone reach out to me and say, dude, I celebrated my year of sobriety and I couldn't have done it without her. Thank you so much. And that warms my heart because through such a tragic incident, I'm able to turn that into a positive and I'm able to help other people through that. And that is an amazing feeling. I get goosebumps talking oh, and about I do it. As well. and it, it, it and it's, it's an not amazing just this feeling. one person. You've had this happen countless times. Yeah. So, I mean – my friend David Laird said it best to me, and I stole the line from him. It's a blessing to be the blessing, you know? And so now, because of this, I'm able to reach and talk to other people and let them know, hey, it's okay. You know, it's okay to feel these things. Um, but the courageous thing to do is to be vulnerable and open up and, and, and ask for help. But it's a lot easier when you know you're talking to somebody that can sympathize with you because they've been through it right. um, and isn't going to have that judgment. So, um, you know, sure, it was horrible. <laughs> like I said, some days are better than others, but I wouldn't change it for the world. And if I had to do it again, I would. And some people might not understand that. Um, there were times where people were like, oh, you're so lucky. I, I can't wait to, you know, get tested. You know, I'm like, dude, if yeah. that's your attitude, yeah. you need to get rid of your gun. Exactly. You shouldn't even be caring because you're, you're going to hurt somebody or yourself. That's not the – I would never wish it upon anybody. It is that traumatic of an experience. Um, but I also think back to when I was a child, my old man teaching me how to shoot gun safety and firearms. He said owning a gun is one of the highest responsibilities that you'll ever have next to being a parent is what he compared it to. And he said, if you're going to continue to be a gun owner and you're going to carry, you need to make sure that you are setting a standard and setting an example and always being responsible. And I took that to heart. And that's why I take it so seriously. That's why I've always trained as much as I had um, and still do, um, because you have to. You know, this is it's a whole lot of responsibility. There's so many things. And people realize, I'm sure that you may have talked about it on the show. Um, I tell people to get off the range. Shooting a target at 21 feet away and climate controlled, perfect lighting. Yeah, no. When I stepped out of that truck, I was on a 360 degree stage. Okay. Zero light because it's 430 in the morning on a January. It's 40 degrees because it's January 12th right. in the open desert. If I would have had rain or snow, it would have been the perfect storm. Yeah, it had lights at you. Headlights at me. I had a covered distance. You know, I'm moving you had cars essentially. Whizzing when I shoot. By. Yeah. So, I mean, again, all that training, all those instructors, you know, I've always thanked um, my good friend, Sean Diango. He was one of the most um, 
crucial and pivotal pieces to my training puzzle. He's initially the one who saw me in Shooter's World because he was a range master, took me under his wing, introduced me to a lot of good guys and gals. And so if it wasn't for his teachings and he actually getting me started on the right road or keeping me on the right road, who knows what would have happened. Um, but to this day, I credit him for that training savvy that I have. And the community outpouring was fascinating. It was. It was. So there's a lot of things that people don't prepare you for. Again, um, and and I don't I don't fault instructors because again, unless you've been through that that incident, you don't know how to teach about that incident. So and, and I find some do even more damage by assuming what's going mm -hmm. to happen and then dictating to you. I, there's an instructor who's very popular who shall not be named, hmm. who tells people, this is going to happen, your body is going to do this, this right. is going... And it's not the same for everyone. No. It might happen at different times, but it's not the same. Right. Um, they're, yeah, the common denominator, but they don't they don't go for everybody. Um, and, it, and if one of those things doesn't happen to you, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Right. It doesn't mean you're not recovering. It doesn't mean you're not healing. Right. Um, the first time a widow of... Um, law enforcement professional came up to me. I was actually at a gathering uh, I had been invited to, and I just got done speaking, and I come off stage, and people are talking to me. She comes up, and she hugs me. And she says, I wish somebody was there for my husband like you were there for Ed. And she's crying. There's no way to respond to that, okay? There's, and that's not in any training manual, any book, or anything <laughs> right. like that. You don't know what to do except to look at her and cry as well. It's a lot of images. It's not uncommon for a full day of a three-gun match um, that I have 10,000 images to sift through. So is your Dropbox bill like 13000 a month? It's not, because I'm very picky. Yeah.